Okay, we've got a lot to talk about and only 30 minutes to do it. So let's make some introductions and we'll jump right in. Jason Rosenbaum, reporter with St. Louis Public Radio, and Joe Manny's with uh, St. Louis Public Radio as well. Sandy Diamond joins us, and she is the program coordinator, Kids Voting Missouri, part of the University of Missouri, St. Louis. So we'll try to go maybe chronological-ish just a little bit, back up to Tuesday. It was close. We've learned uh, late this week. There will not be a recount from the Bernie Sanders campaign, even though they were well within the range that they could have. Yeah, but there never was going to be a recount. Never going to be one. That was was a non-issue. That was a non-issue. Somebody who didn't really understand the state process kind of threw that out there early on. But the fact is, anybody involved in Missouri politics knows that it takes a month before uh, an election is certified by the Secretary of State's office. So you, they wouldn't even be able to ask for a recount until April 15th. So what is and the fact that, time, that so, what, so what did it tell you that it was so close, though? What did the fact that, 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 that Bernie came so close to beating Hillary, what did that say to, to all of you? Well, I think it, it said that, A, he had a lot of young voters and some uh, labor activists and others who were very much behind him. I think that showed some dissatisfaction within the Democratic Party. There's also dissatisfaction within the GOP. But Close it's on that side, too. But it's different. Within the Democratic Party, Sanders represented, um, he was challenging the establishment, as is uh, Donald Trump. The difference is that Sanders has generally been coming in second to Hillary, and most of the establishment Democrats, even though they're embattled, have managed to get her across the finish line. And that's what happened here. Yeah, I was frankly kind of surprised about the Democratic result, not because I don't think Bernie Sanders is a, a so far running a fairly excellent campaign given what he has, but because the demographics and organizational aspects of Missouri seem to favor Hillary Clinton pretty strongly. When you think about it, pretty much every major and minor Democratic politician endorsed Hillary Clinton, and you had many prominent labor organizations endorsing Hillary Clinton, and then in 2008, when she ran against then-Senator Obama, she swept rural Missouri. And based off her newfound strength among African-American voters, Missouri on paper should have been a slam dunk for her. But it turns out that Sanders does have a lot of appeal with younger voters. Um, his, his message of trade apparently seems to be taking resonance. Um, across the state. Which sounds a little similar to Donald Trump when you go to the rally. Well, both of them. He and Trump are both emphasizing uh, trade, the dissatisfaction with the trade deals that you have some people, especially middle-aged people who lost their jobs uh, ten, within the last 20 years. Uh, Missouri's, the, all these small factories that used to be in rural Missouri, they're pretty much gone. And, that, and that's that way throughout the Midwest. And so both Trump and Sanders are sort of feeding on that dissatisfaction. They share it, but the point is it's from different viewpoints. I, I look at it a different way because I run a K-12 uh, youth voter program. And we had a few schools that voted uh, in the presidential primary. We did a mock primary. It's amazing that the results are almost exactly the same. Uh, we, Hillary won the election, but she did not want, win by a large margin. Uh, Bernie Sanders uh, came, came in uh, second. So it, 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 it's eerie to me. Uh, kids don't normally vote the way their parents are voting, but it's still a, a, a way to look at uh, the election. The other thing is the effect of social media on this election. With, when I work with the youth, that's all they're looking at. They're looking at sh- social media. They're not watching any of the TV programs. They're not watching cable news. In fact, uh, print media, it, 1% of the youth is looking at print media where uh, um, I think the Pew Research just did a study on this and 35% of the youth of that age group are, are looking at social media. Both Bernie uh, and Donald Trump both have significant social media campaigns on Facebook, on Twitter, on Snap, you know, Snapchat. Or, yeah, Snapchat. Snapchat, whatever it is, yeah. <laughs> And I would be remiss uh, if I didn't say we every week like to, t- to have you engage with us as well. Hashtag stay tuned SDL. But maybe we'd be better off trying to find them with hashtag stay tuned SDL than finding us. And the other thing us. as an educator, I think that you have to look at the old, ban- uh, the old uh, propaganda techniques. This is a clear election uh, on both sides with the bandwagon technique that you might all remember from Civics 101. Uh, They're jumping on the bandwagon. Everybody's voting for them. You see that all the time. And I think that that the young people want to be part of, they see 
you know, all the, um, uh, you know, pizzazz on uh, the ads, uh, the social media, and people want to be part of that. And I'm part of let, let me kind of uh, jump on, again, the surprising aspects of this. When we think of rural Missouri and outstate Missouri, we think of a place that where conservative candidates who are opposed to gun control and are opposed to gun control and abortion will do well. Yet we had a Democratic Socialist do well in rural Missouri, and we had a brash New York multi-billionaire who used to be pro-choice and for gun control win most of rural Missouri. And that strikes me that maybe, A, those issues aren't as resonant as they used to be, and B, Sanders and Trump's populist message, their message on trade, must have resonated with some people. Well, some of it, but I think also in, in Trump's case, I mean, because you've got two different situations. You've got Clinton, where the establishment managed to get her across the finish line. You've got, in the Republican primary, you've got Trump, who's not the establishment at all, and the Republican establishment couldn't get uh, Cruz or anybody else. In fact, most of the establishment in the, in the state on the Republican side, the largest block, had been for Rubio, and that's only because they had all been with Jeb Bush and after he, he went out. So I think if for, in Trump's case, while he's talking trade and he's feeding on people's satisfaction, he's kind of tapped into the Tea Party movement, which was dissatisfaction with trade, dissatisfaction with immigration, dissatisfaction with a whole bunch of stuff, just people that are really but, angry but ironically, about everything. But like, the Tea Party movement was all about principled stands and how many times has Donald Trump changed his position in a, in a series of a debate? So, so what does, can you take anything from this and, and look ahead to our statewide primary? How, or even the general election, if it's Trump and it's Clinton, how might those candidates affect people down the ballot? Well, now, Missouri's primary is in August, and there's no presidential in there. Sure, so, sure. So but the, the sentiment we've sick. seen in this past election, does it tell you anything about August, or would the general be affected? Well, it, they might in the Missouri Republican primary, which which today I was writing a story about sex slaves. So, so I mean the the Republican primary for governor and also the Republican primary for attorney general, there is a lot of passion there and there's a lot of turmoil in there. It's different than the presidential, but it's still tapped into that you know among many voters that anger. I think in November it's really unclear how much of a. Um, Hotel effect there's going to be. I'm not sure. Frankly, um, the Democrats don't need to win Missouri to win the presidency anymore. Barack Obama proved that in 2008 and 2012. So I don't think either of us foresee the National Democratic Party putting a lot of paying resources. attention to us. But if if the results of the presidential race is close, or Hillary Clinton wins Missouri, then it means that the nominee, whether it be Trump or Ted Cruz or I don't know whoever they choose at a contested convention is just not resonating with Before us. we go too much farther, I want to circle back to what Sandy was saying about the young vote. Uh, our producer, Maya Northfleet, sat down this week with uh, some first-time voters, some first-time to be eligible uh, voters. Not all of them have voted. Uh, let's hear what they have to say, what they're feeling about 2016.
use it while we're talking. Uh, that uh, <laughs> is whose fault is it? Is it our fault that the young people aren't necessarily engaged? Um, Do we, have we set a bad example? They, 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 it doesn't seem like maybe something that's a, a very appealing I, to get into. I think that I see young people very engaged, and then they get disillusioned, and that's what I'm afraid is going to happen. Uh, as you know, Bernie's camp has uh, you know engaged a lot of students. In fact, they were saying in the articles that I've been reading that. It's all the col you know, the, co the the states with all the colleges. Like there's some states with 400 universities, and he's appealing to all these these college students. And what's going to happen if he is not the candidate? Uh, w w are they going to come out and vote? You know, are they going to take their citizenship responsibility seriously? Uh, and and vote, for, you know, just ex exercise their right to vote. If the I'm, excitement I'm, of Bernie is gone, will they the, still be engaged? And that's what I'm very, very concerned about because you saw that in the 2008 to 2012 election where the young people came out in droves, uh, 18 to 28-year-old, uh, and voted for Obama. The numbers fell off in 2012. They just weren't as excited when he ran for re-election. So I am concerned. Uh, you know, it, it's up to us. It's up to all the educators uh, that um, inspire the young people, both in high school and colleges, to try to get them to understand their civic responsibility, that it's the voting. It's, it's becoming an informed voter. Uh, and you, you have, have to actually to go to the ballot. You can't, you, you can't just right. be engaged on social you, you media. You have to make, you know, make some choices and determine, you know, which candidate is best for you. But I think it's also up to the candidates as well. I think that the Clinton campaign, they will have a challenge. I mean, assuming that she continues with her lead, they're going to have a challenge to try to get the kids who've been energized for Sanders to at least come out and vote for Clinton. But this is an odd situation. I covered the Sanders rally um, last Sunday, and I was asking several uh, of the attendees who are big Sanders fans, young people, and I asked him, if he doesn't get it, who's your second choice? Well, they all said they'll vote for Clinton. They're not going to vote for Trump. In fact, they hate him. So the one thing that may help her is that potentially uh, you may have some of these young people turn out not because they're for Clinton. They're but, against Trump. But they're against Trump. But, but things can change. I mean, things can change so rapidly these days. Um, let's go back to the governor's race for Missouri. We just barely touched on that for a second. It, it, from the outside, it kind of mirrors the national presidential race a little bit in that you've got a somewhat crowded Republican field in a fairly well-known and established smaller one mainly Democratic well, I mean, candidate. there is technically a Democratic primary between Chris Coster and Leonard Steinman, <laughs> who looks like Santa Claus. But it, you're right in that sense that there are four major Republican candidates, John Bruner, Peter Kinder, Catherine Hannaway, and Eric Greitens. And all four of them have their own strengths and weaknesses, but I would say that they're all viable candidates to win the nomination. And I, I would say that they're all viable potential you know, gubernatorial winners. Yeah, now what's interesting is that unlike in the uh, presidential contest, they're all four of them are on the same page on virtually every major issue from guns, abortion, uh, uh, taxes, right to work, you name it, they're all pretty much on the same page. So where they're trying to define differences is really personally, either how they're raising money or who some of their donors are. You've got, you know, Greitens and Bruner who are somewhat outsiders. Bruner right now is self-funding, you know, he's, he's a wealthy mil millionaire. You've got Hannaway who's the only woman in the race and emphasizing the fact that she's a prosecutor. Um, and then you've got, um, Peter Kinder is lieutenant governor. He says, I'm the only one of these people who's actually won statewide, and I've won three times statewide. And so they're all trying to fashion themselves as saying, I'm the best person to take on Chris Coster, the attorney general who is really, the, the, in, the, in effect, the Democratic nominee. And then Eric Greitens, who is, if I'm not mistaken, the most well-funded. Yes. Is he the most well-known? No. 
Is he known at all? I think he's known in a similar way that Ben Carson was known in the sense that he's a published author and has a following. Has a following. I'm not trying to, obviously Ben Carson was controversial during his campaign and flamed out, and I'm not saying Eric Greitens is going to do that. But what I'm trying to say is when I went to see Eric, or when I went to see Ben Carson speak in St. Louis during the Eagle Forum convention, there were like hundreds of people who knew who he was and were really enthusiastic about him because they knew about Eric story. Greitens might be better and, known. And Eric, he, he's on uh, the late shows on the national and, television. And Eric he might, Greitens might be in a similar situation, but this is his first campaign. And we're finding out today that, you know, because he has raised a lot of money and because people see him as a threat in the general election, I think that he's being the most attacked and it's going to be. Yes. Re- is it going to be nasty like the national race? I think some of it is. I mean, Greitens already has come under fire. First, there was a, he's a former Navy SEAL. So there's a group of Navy SEALs who produced a video. I wrote about this about a month ago. To kind Supposedly of dis- Navy SEALs. I think he was questioning whether it was even. I know, I know, even- but it's a whole swift boat thing, right. you know, in, in effect. And, you know, they were challenging how he behaved and this and that. Of course, he has countered with his own video. And when he had his press conference, there was a bunch of local veterans who showed up in, in, in support. Now the big thing is, see, his, big don- his biggest donor is a, a venture capitalist from California. And who's given him a million dollars, 500,000 in two different uh, installments. Well, the Republican challengers who don't have as much money, although Bruner is self-funding right now, so he's okay. They're attacking him because this California venture capitalist is now the subject of a lawsuit filed by an ex-stripper who claims that she was his sex slave. for. Joe, you have so many juicy (laughs) storylines that you are currently working on. We call this a tease in the business. I feel like we'll all be going to St. Louis Public Radio.com. I feel like this is going to have to be rated TV 14. It was coming up in the debates. They're, they're, They're now all calling, the others are calling on him to return the money. And that was supposed to be the big hallmark at the most recent debate. Yeah. Okay, we had record turnout uh, this past Tuesday yeah. for a Missouri presidential primary. Uh, our other producer, Justin Hartman, uh, sat down with a young man who is actually working on that. Uh, he's an artist, and he has a, a rather unique approach to try to improve voter turnout, because it still wasn't great if you look at the overall percentages. The are a lot. Should we? We have three minutes on the back end. Should we talk about, or can we talk about earnings tax? U.S. Senate, that's blunt up, right? Blunt, blunt, blunt candor. Yeah. Blunt candor, yeah. And that one may be the most tied to the presidential. So the do you want to do earnings tax like real quick and then give us your thoughts on, what do you, how do you want to spend our last three minutes? Well, it, I could see either one. It depends. I mean. The earnings tax is, we can do both. Okay, okay. What do you think? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll, we'll have to do it quick. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to yeah. be pointed. Do you have a, do you have a, any final thoughts you want me to make sure I get in there? Um, no, it's in general. The, the, the focus, you know, you're talking about governor and U.S. Senate, except that there's no, when you try to get the people excited about it, no one's talking about it. Yeah. You're talking about it, but the people out there, the, the young people, no one hears about it. And yet... It affects their lives more than the presidential, but we're not talking about it. We probably won't be talking about yeah, it. Yeah, you're right. The, the, the races that actually I mean, affect our lives. There was the nothing in the slave. paper. You talked Sorts about. I didn't even know there was a governor tour. debate tonight yeah. until they told me. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where they're advertising that, and I watch every news program. That Justin, could you dump out of this during the next m- musical interlude, or even now? Okay. I just bought us a little more time, I think, a few okay. seconds, but okay. pretend like I didn't oh. say that. <laughs> okay. Unless you think it'll ruin it. If it's not going to save us more than 20 seconds, don't do it. Okay. You know, so I'm atypical. I watch everything. I'm tuned into everything. Uh, but the- so, okay, so he hopes more people will vote. We're excited to talk about this right now. The people watching presumably are. Are people in general engaged on these lower issues beyond Trump and Clinton? When you say lower issues, like the city earnings tax? Like the city earnings tax. I think people do talk talk about it. I'm not sure the young people are talking about these issues, but it's up to educators to bring these issues to the forefront. And that's what we try to do in all of our schools, is try to get these young people to become informed voters, to know the issues, and then get them not 
we don't tell them which way to go, but to try to get them to see both sides of an issue. And, and I really do think that that has to be brought to them. Uh, we have to tell them, you know, that PBS is on, uh, we have St. I'm serious. I mean, if you don't, if, if someone isn't the role model to tell the young people where, where to turn to get information, I'm not talking social media. Yeah. They do not know the difference. And these are the races that people will tell us affect our lives more right. than Clinton versus correct, Trump. Correct. In fact, in the whole debate over the earnings tax, I mean, it's going to be in the April ballot. The issue is whether or not to phase it out, as some want. And, uh, and the city says would be uh, extremely detrimental to oh, the yeah, city. Oh, it's, it's about 40% 40, 40 of their income. I mean, they're saying that in effect they'd have to get rid of the fire department. Uh, Rex Singfeld, who's a wealthy financier who has a house in St. Louis, has put up $2 million for the anti-earnings tax campaign. So they have, they're buying TV ads, radio ads, flyers. They're paying for canvassers. They're really going to be pouring a lot of money. I mean, think about it. $2 million for just a city campaign. And even and the mayor and the people who are supporting the earnings tax are not going to be able to match that. So, does, close. so does it have a chance of going down? Does it, does it have a chance? Does that effort well, have I a chance think, of being I successful? Believe in 2011, it passed. I mean, the, the earnings tax was re-upped overwhelmingly, but there was no no campaign. And, correct. correct. And, and I think the fact that there is a pretty aggressive no campaign now should incentivize people in St. Louis city government to kind of get up and start bargaining. Is there a plan B if they lose 40% of the city well, uh, budget? No, because uh, they would have to raise uh, sales tax or do other things so high or cut services. So one of the things, I mean, dramatically, we're not talking a little bit, we're talking dramatically. One of the reasons that there was no anti earnings tax campaign in the city in 2011 is because at that point the mayor and some of the um, civic leaders were saying that they would talk over the next few years about maybe if there I were they, I think they said this is a warning we have five years to figure out right. a way to do and this they, and really nothing changed. But really they can't I mean I'm not saying there isn't an alternative I'm just saying if they have not found one because they would have to raise sales tax. We have just a we have just so a couple high. of uh, a few seconds left tell me about the U.S. Senate race uh, uh, Republican Senator Roy Blunt is up for re-election. He's running against Secretary of State Jason Kander a Democrat I think he's only like four or five years older than me. Um, he, in order for Kander to be competitive, the national democratic apparatus is going to have to get behind him and provide him with enough funding because Blunt is going to be well stocked. He's run statewide a bunch of times. He's going to be strong in southwest Missouri. And it's going to be a challenge, but I don't think it's an insurmountable one. You know, Kander is an ex-veteran and it's really emphasizing that. And Kander has been on the attack for months, even if not everybody's paying attention to it. He's been really going after Blunt on everything from the fact his son is a lobbyist to uh, uh, the uh, Blunt's own lack of a military record during the Vietnam War, all that stuff. And it's, it, it may be white noise right now, but I think they're basically testing themes to see what works. And you said that the Democrats are not going to pay much attention to us in terms of the presidential race. Right. Does that have an impact on the Senate race? Not necessarily, no. because if, if – if they do polling and find out that the Missouri Senate race is competitive, I think Kander will have enough resources in order to be competitive. But unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, in congressional races, the national parties loom large. And if you don't have their support and their money and organization, you're probably not going to win. Yeah, the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee is the major, is the major elephant in the room here. And so they've been paying very close and been doing some polling, as is the Republican counterpart. We have to leave it there. Uh, Jason, Joe, and Sandy, thank you all for your time. Thanks for watching.